there is some benefit of looking at the Sermon on the Mount as a whole. And so, um, so we're going to talk about that a little bit today and, um, and try to, uh, to kind of get further into the text. Um, but uh, before, we, uh, before we start reading and uh, reviewing, I am, um, want to invite you to, um, to pause for a moment of prayer and silent reflection. Merciful God, speak to us. We, your servants, are listening. This book, our Bibles, they contain your word. Open up the ears of our hearts that we may hear you speak to us. Jesus. Jesus speaks to us his sermon. These words are difficult. They are radical. They show us a new way. Help us to take this in as much as we can and live in the light that you show us. Through Jesus our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen. So let's, let's review for just a moment about what we've been learning of Matthew's Gospel. Can you remember anything from the first week? What have we been talking about? The beginning. The beginning. It's, in fact, that was the very first... Very first um, the first two words of the book of, uh, of the book of, what book are we studying? Matthew. Um, in Greek was Biblios. Remember that? Book. Or we get the word Bible. Right? The, the Bible is another way of saying the book. The book. This is not just any book. This is the book. Um, the, the book of Genesis. That's how it starts. A book of Genesis of Jesus Christ. So it's a great place to start the New Testament with this new beginning. What else did we learn? What about those begot? The women. Huh? Yeah, that was wild stuff, right? Jesus um, was in this long line of people, and um, particularly women, who were not powerful, who were from the outside. They were um, Gentiles, right? And they didn't have power, and yet they turned the whole thing over and uh, brought down the powerful patriarchs of Israel and did God's new thing. Um, what else have we? Uh, what else have we talked about? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Yeah. What did What did John the Baptist do? The messenger. He brought the messenger. That's right. His His job was to get out of the way, right? And then we talked about how. That's an, that might be a good job for us. That um, sometimes, you know, we want to be the shining star in the middle of the stage. Um, but there is a role there of getting out of the way for what God wants to do in the, um, in the future. What else have we learned? The kings were not king. The kings, yeah. The we three kings wasn't, right? There weren't necessarily three of them, and they weren't kings. They were... Magicians, they were pagan priests. They were religious leaders from another tradition who got it right while everybody else got it wrong. Yeah, that's right. What about Jesus and the flight to Egypt? What, is, what, is, what does that mean? Flight to Egypt. It wasn't Delta. He was a refugee. He was a political refugee when Herod tried to kill all the babies and they escaped to Egypt. I mean, um... What, a, what an amazing story that Jesus lived into. Anything else that we've learned? What about the temptations? It's kind of interesting that uh, Genesis begins with the temptation and the fall of man. And about the same point in the story, Matthew starts with the temptation. But this is the new order. And Jesus does not succumb to the temptation of Adam and Eve. Yeah. I think that's great. I think I told you uh, maybe in the first week that, that because Matthew is writing to what kind of audience? A Jewish audience. He's dropping Old Testament references everywhere. I mean, we, we went through the number of them, and um, it was like a whole bunch. And, um, and you don't even know when you're in the middle of one. And so, I mean, like the whole idea of starting with Genesis, well, that, that was kind of one. But then the temptation story of Jesus reminds us of the garden story. And, um, and it's, it's kind of echoing, echoing off of that. And then Jesus is playing a certain kind of typology. We talked about 
or um, the, the word that we use was recapitulation. You remember, what was Jesus recapitulating in his life? Israel. Say that. That's extra credit right there. <laughs> recapitulation. And so, how did Jesus recapitulate Israel? How did he do it? This is important for today's lesson. It came out again. Yes, so, so the, the life of Jesus was patterned after the life of Israel. With running from a king, in Jesus' case, Herod, in Moses' case, in Israel's case, Pharaoh, you've got the deliverance. Um, instead of going through the Red Sea, and Jesus went through the River Jordan, but you remember they went through the River Jordan too on the way back into the Promised Land. And instead of being in the wilderness for 40 years, Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days. And so, um, so his life is recapitulating the life. He is Israel. He is Israel in its, in its fullness. The devil used scripture too. That's a really good point. Sometimes, um, a, uh, well, what is Susan Norred says, a half-truth is a lie. We learned that in Disciple Bible Study. And so so um, a Bible verse taken out of context, which um, Christians do all the time, is worse than not having the Bible, period. Um, we have to read the Bible through a greater lens as a whole, not just picking pieces and parts out because... Because it can do worse, um, worse damage. So, um, so hold the back end of your mind. Jesus being a uh, recapitulation of Israel, and then the last thing we talked about last week was the call of discipleship. And I want you to think about for today and the next few lessons about looking at Matthew's Gospel, um, chapter twenty-eight. You don't need to turn there right now, but yeah, let's go ahead and turn there. That's what I want us to do. This is really important. This is one of the most important scriptures in the whole Bible, but I believe that it is, um, back when I was in school, in uh, high school in particular, they would say, you know, before you write at the beginning of the essay, tell them what you're going to tell them, and then tell them, and at the end of the essay, tell them what you told them. Now they say, well, that's how you write a really boring thing that nobody would read. <laughs> when you write something that's interesting, you tell them, kind of what direction you're going to go, then you psych them out, don't go that way, and then you finally go that way, and then at the end you tell them what you've just shown them. So Matthew's Gospel is written like a good story. That's like a, if, if you watched a movie and the beginning of the movie said, all right, well, this guy's going to die, this guy's going to live, and the good guys win. It's terribly boring, right? So Because um, what makes the story interesting is conflict. Well, the Gospel of Matthew works the same way, and at the very, very end, you get the meaning of the story. This is the, um, the theme. This is the theme. This is, what it, this is what the kingdom of God looks like. So Matthew 28, did I tell you to go there? Yeah. Matthew 28, and it's verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciple of all nations. Now, what have we learned so far? Well, all nations... The, um, the Greek word for nations is ethnos, and it's the same word for Gentiles, national, uh, nationalism. There's a, nationalism is always has a race component because it means the same thing. Nationalism and ethnic is the same, is, are their synonyms. And so go into all nations. Where have we seen all nations represented in the story so far? The women. Right and the Magi, and we're gonna we're gonna go into more and more. So the mission, the mission is to go into all nations, and then to do what? Baptizing them. We already hit that a little bit, didn't we? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So um, so that's into the Godhead, into the Trinity. Um, baptizing them in, into this into this name to be a part of the life of God. And then this kind of gets to the core. Of, um, of what the gospel is about. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded them. And remember, I am with you all to the end of the age. So what is the mission of the church? Number one, it's to make disciples. And we make disciples of all people, not excluding anyone. We make disciples of all people. And in, in doing that, how do you make disciples? Disciple is a education word, right? Today we think, well, disciples, well, those are the 12 dudes. But no, disciples is a person with a teacher. So go forward and make students and teach students. And so evangelism, according to the Gospel of St. Matthew, how does it look? 
it looks like class, right? I mean, it, evangelism looks like teaching. It's like teaching your kids. If you want to know how evangelism looks in Matthew, go and teach your kids about the gospel. Teach the kids about grace and, um, and these Christian, Christian values of justice and mercy. If you want to know what evangelism looks like, according to Matthew, that, that's where it's done. In, in the classroom. And so there it makes sort of sense. How much does Jesus preach in the Gospel of Mark? Any scholars, any Markan scholars here? How about the, what about the sermon? What about, what about the sermon in, Ma, in Mark's Gospel? It ain't there. No, in Mark's Gospel, Jesus, he preaches a sermon. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the sermon. And he, you know, he throws a parable out here or there. But... In, in Matthew's gospel, that wasn't enough. Jesus is the teacher, and, and in order to get inaugurated into this kingdom, in order to live into the kingdom, you've got to be educated by the great doctor, the great teacher of the church, which is Jesus. And that is where the Sermon on the Mount comes in. So then Regina did remember, in Luke's gospel, we have, we have teaching too that mirrors this teaching, but where did it happen? It happened on the flat ground, right? And what, where does Matthew say this lesson happened? On top of a mountain. On top of a mountain. So, um, well, which one was right? Well, that's not a good question. That's not a good question. Um, because they're both saying different things. I mean, Jesus could have preached multiple times. I mean, it's the same sermon, basically. He could have preached it multiple times. But what Matthew cares about is not geography. You can go to the Holy Land with us, like we our church did, and stand on the Mount of Beatitudes, and they say, well, this, this might be where it happened. Or that one over there, or that one over there, or it could have just happened down there. Who knows? Um, we don't know exactly where it happened. But the point of it is what? That he is recreating Moses. Moses. And Moses got it on the map. That's right. So we're back to the recapitulation thing. Jesus on the mountain because it was at the mountain Sinai that, the, that Israel got the law. That was the great teaching. The great teaching. So law, Torah in Hebrew is law, but it is also instruction. It's a synonym for instruction or teaching. So now Jesus has come to the mountain and now he is issuing Torah. He's issuing teaching, and it just so happens that the Sermon on the Mount parallels and touches the Ten Commandments in many ways. So we're going to look at that. So it's not about where Jesus stood geographically, but about where he stood theologically. He is Israel embodied, presenting the law, presenting the law, and, uh, and we're going to come into some really interesting stuff on that. So flip back to... Wherever we are, Matthew 5, verse 1. Matthew 5, verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. Okay, so there we go. Um, he didn't go up the mountain. Some, some scholars will say, well, they ran up the mountain to go away from the people. I and mean, we have stories like that where he gets in the boat where he just wants to rest and he, they don't even have... Uh, it says they don't even have leisure to eat. See, they were Methodist. They needed leisure to eat. But, um, no, Jesus is not going up there to get away from everybody. He's going up to the mountain because he's presenting this important, magnificent sermon that is Torah. That is Torah. And then after that, he sat down. Okay, why did he sit down? Because teachers sat down. Right? So um, for, for out, almost all of Christian history... The congregation stood up for the entire service. Did you know that? The congregation stood up, and who sat down? The preacher. The preacher sat down, and everybody else stood up. I don't know why we don't do that again. I mean, sometimes my legs get tired. Yeah. You couldn't be still long enough. I couldn't be still long enough. <laughs> So even today, when the Pope has something really important to say, he issues it ex cathedra, which means he goes and... We know what cathedra means? Ex cathedra? It means from the chair. From the chair. So if, and a cathedral is a place that has a chair. 
which is where the bishop sits. So if you wanted to know the truth about the church, you got to go and talk to the bishop, and the bishop is in the cathedral where the chair is. So Jesus is here now, sitting down, prepared to teach to the masses who are presumably standing. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Wow. You've heard this before, right? So, um, what does it mean to be blessed? To be blessed. What's our first take at looking at this uh, selection? The Amplified says, morally courageous, spiritually alive, life, joy, and God's goodness. Well, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it, um... It's kind of a hard word to um, to translate um, because uh, we don't we don't have easy uh, parallels in English. Uh, some some say some translations say happy. I don't think that I don't think that really gets it because um, uh, because happy um, can be somewhat of a shallow emotion. And I can tell you what um, the poor aren't always happy. Right? And the hungry aren't always happy, and the persecuted, well, they're not happy. And so, blessed is, I think, a pretty good word, uh, because the, the Greek word is um, makaria, and it means, um, it, it, it means something like whole. Um, like um, whole and blessed, it's close to shalom in Hebrew. It's uh, close, close to that kind of definition. Yeah? I listened to a study one time when it said that the Blessed in the attitudes or those that were special in the eyes of God. Yeah. Yeah, so um so this this um this denotation on these people as being blessed is something that God gives. Right? So so from the outside, none of these people look look happy. They don't look they don't look blessed. So this this is a status that comes from God despite the facts on the ground. This is not normal. No, no, this is this is not the way the world is. This is something that only comes that only comes from God. And so these beatitudes are really uh, apocalyptic. Apocalyptic. Anybody have a good definition of that word? Apocalyptic. Revealing. Revealing. Right. So apocalyptic, like the Book of Revelation, isn't really about what's going to happen in the future. It's about what is really true. Like what's lasting. What, what, where's the future? Where's the future in all of this? If you pull back the curtain on the world, who are the blessed ones and who ain't? That's, that's the question. When you look out at the world, it seems like the wicked get rewarded. And that's what's happening. But Jesus' sermon says something different. It says that what you see with your naked eye isn't true. That God sees the world in a different way. Another way to look at it is that they all start with this. Um, they use they start with a present. So blessed are that's a present tense word. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Then it moves to future. But theirs is, and it's a present. A, um, a, a future tense is. If you go back to some of these others, like the mourn, they will. Be comforted. Each one moves from present. Blessed are those who are this now. In the future, in God's kingdom, they're comforted. They're rich. They're whole. They're in the kingdom. And so it's it's Jesus saying, "This is how the world looks in God's eyes," and uh, and it's inviting us to look into a new um, a new way. So Luke's gospel, it says, blessed are the poor. Luke, Luke does not add in spirit. And uh, Matthew's gospel, it adds in spirit. 
And um, any thoughts about why it might do that? Right. That when Luke talks about the poor, well, Luke is primarily, if you've ever read Luke's gospel through and through, Luke is obsessed with the people on the bottom of society. And so Luke wants to emphasize, this is the poor. The poor. Matthew is trying to open it up a little bit and is defining, if you read through the books, the book of Psalms, or the books of Psalms, there are five books of Psalms in our Bibles, um, the poor are mentioned a lot, and, and the poor ones are God's ones. And so blessed, blessed are the ones who are, um, to, to be poor in spirit also means to be uh, okay. broken, depressed, okay. and oppressed. Yeah, it means, it means all of that. And so, so what I think that we shouldn't say, well, to be poor in spirit, well, that's just spiritualizing it. Those are the ones who are, who are um, not rich in faith, but are poor in faith. That's, that's not what it's saying here. It's broadening what, what it means to be poor. And it's, it's any kind of form of lowliness, whether it's physical or um, spiritual, anything. Now let's move on to another one that's really difficult to find, uh, to figure out. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. You know, most of my life I thought that meant that you were blessed if you wanted to be good. If you wanted to be good, right? Because I, well, I, I want to be righteous. That ain't what it's saying here. No, if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, what are you hungering and thirsting for? Equality. Yes. The, the word here for righteousness is the same word for justice. So the person who hungers and thirsts for righteousness is hungering and thirsting for justice. They've had an injustice happened against them. In this case, it would have most likely been Rome because they did all the injustice of that day. Or a good, they did their good share of injustice. And so if you're hungry and thirsty for justice, what's going to happen? God's going to bring justice. That's what the second coming is about, too, right? That, that if, um, if something's done wrong to you and there's no justice in the world because it's been done wrong to you by your government or by someone who's, who powers over you, oppresses you, that God's going to clean it out. This has nothing to do with your hunger for personal holiness. That's a good holiness. That's a good hunger to have. But that is not what Jesus is talking about here. This is about those who are on the margins of society who don't have, um, who don't have rights and can't execute them. Um, that God sees that and God and the kingdom will take care of it. And that kind of follows through when you get to persecuted. That, that's almost a synonymous kind of idea. If you've been oppressed by the government persecuted, that um, God's got your back and everything will be fine. The other thing that I think is important about this is that this is unconditional performative language. Unconditional performative language. Any idea what, what that might mean? It means it's something like what a prophet would do. So this is not what the way it is right now, but by the person speaking it begins to make it true. So Jesus in this, like an Old Testament prophet, is speaking the word of God, and it, it is becoming true um, in, in the language itself, that the, the word has power, like, like the words that created the world. So this is unconditional performative language, prophetic, a prophetic announcement. This is the way that God sees the world. Any thoughts or questions about the Beatitudes here before we move on to some more of the sermon? Um... These Beatitudes begin the sermon with a frame about what God's kingdom looks like, what, what, what God values in the world, and where God's heart is. Where is God's heart, according to the Beatitudes? With the blessed ones. Who are the blessed ones? The poor and the broken. Yeah, so uh, my reflection question for us to ponder is, who are the blessed ones in our community? Who is hungry for justice? Who does knowing... Hmm, how does knowing the way God sees the world change the way we see it? So to live in the Beatitudes is to figure out where are the broken ones in the world. Maybe there are them. Um, we talked about some people who are in the hospital um, or at the bridge or wherever. Um, they're blessed. And um, God, God is with them. Um, there's people in the world that are persecuted for their faith. Um, God is with them. There's people in our, in our community that are persecuted economically. We've got systemic economic issues dating back to slavery in our community and in our nation. We've got all kinds of forms of old oppression. And God is with whom? 
oppressed. The oppressed, yeah. The, the ones that are broken, the ones that have come upon hard times, the depressed ones, the lost ones. That's where God's heart is. And that's the beginning of Jesus' sermon, revealing God's heart and revealing the world that God is bringing in the kingdom. And it sets everything else up. But it's a really different transformation. I think that a lot of people um, think that being blessed is the opposite. You know, sometimes we'll say, um, you know, I just got me this new boat and I'm so blessed. <laughs> right? And I think that part of that is good because we want to be thankful and, um, and every gift is a gift from God. Um, but um, Jesus doesn't say... Blessed are the people with Carolina's gifts. You know? I mean, um, blessed are the people that got great cars or um, that, um, that live at the beach. You know, that, um, that's not the kind of blessed that Jesus is showing us. And I think that maybe we ought to be a little more careful about how we talk about bless and where, where God's blessings really are um, in the world. It's a... It's a I think that the Beatitudes is a radical recalibration of how Christians are to look at the world. And um, it's, strong, it's strong stuff. Any other thoughts before we move on to the next section? When people say bless you. Bless you. Like when you sneeze? Yeah. It's easier to say bless you than go through tight. Yeah. So I recommend it. Yeah, I don't think it, I don't think it hurts. And I think that... Um, you know, Christians believe that words are really, really powerful, and that when we bless people, um, that that something real happens. You know, and that, I mean, when, when we lift up our hands towards a person being baptized, I mean, that's not just, we don't believe that's just a ritual. We believe that, that in our prayers and our blessings, that there's true blessing in, in both. And so I think that it's good for us to bless people who are sick. I mean, the whole idea about blessing somebody when they sneeze is to offer blessing to somebody who is sick. Right, it's um, that's the whole purpose. But I think I think we need to go beyond that and offer blessings to um, to poor communities, uh, for marginalized people, for people that don't have rights. Um, that that's where that's where Jesus is, and we need to get, run out and find find where Jesus is. Well, well, you've just taken this to a much higher level than I was going to. But, um, <laughs> to answer your question. I some of you may know, that comes from a medieval superstition that when you sneeze, your spirit, your spirit left your body just for an instant. It was um, uh, open for the devil to, to uh, jump and steal it. And so he said, bless you to protect that spirit. That's where it comes from. Yeah, yeah. That's right, particularly uh, that German tradition, yes. Today, you know, Christians always say, or maybe not Christians, when you go through a real trying, troubled time, disaster in your family or whatever, is when you are drawn closer to God. Isn't that what we're really seeing here? That these people have no hope in the world at all, and they learn that their only hope is God. And so, even though they don't show it on the outside, God sees the inside and sees that yearning for Him to come and relieve their situation. Their, their hope is entirely on God. I think that's right. Um, what Jesus is saying, you who have no hope because your government, your communities have taken it away, um, you who have no hope, there's, a greater, there's more to the story. When, when um, there's more to the story than Rome knows, God's got this story, and, um, and your life may look like a tragedy, but it's really a comedy. It's really going to end up. It's not, it's not ending down that God's in control of the story. And I think that whenever we are suffering, we, um, we have an inability to, um, to see that hope sometimes. And, and so I think the Sermon on the Mount is particularly for um, people that desperately need that, that hope. That God, um, even in death, even in death, God brings life. And that's something that, that's core to the Christian message. And you can see that here in, in the beginning of the Beatitudes. That there's more, there's more to life than living. There's, there's life beyond it. Yeah. Let's move a little bit uh, further down to um, some harder parts of this. 
You are the salt of the earth, and if the salt has lost its taste, how can the saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but it's thrown around and trampled underfoot. You're the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Yeah, so uh, salt. Um, well, salt's really important in the Roman world. Um, let's see, this week, in the lectionary text has me preaching on the Beatitudes, so you're already a leg up. You can come late to church, I guess. Um, and then um, next week is on this text here, uh, but salt is really important. Um, how did, um, you know, the word salary, salary comes from the word salt, because... Roman soldiers were off, they didn't have like a lot of coins, but they were paid in salt because you needed salt. And then they would say, you know, you're not worth your salt, right? You're not worth your salt. So, so salt is something really, really important. But now how does salt lose its saltiness? Can, does it, um, does the saltiness wear off of salt? Does it wear off of salt? Does when you leave your shaker in the cabinet too long, does it become less salty? No. no. How does it, how do you lose, how would you lose saltiness? <laughs> By dilution, right? So now we've got an idea. How do you keep your saltiness? You don't dilute it with other things, right? Um, often in the Bible, salt is a bad thing. In this case, it's a very good thing. And uh, I think another thing that it says is, um, and I like this question. Why are Christians so boring? Showing the world a bland melba toast. I probably was going to write more there. How can we be saltier? And I think that sometimes um, Christians think, well, you know, being a Christian... Well, it's not very, it's not really interesting. But, I mean, reading the Beatitudes, that's, that's crazy, right? That's salty. That's different than the world knows. And so Jesus is really asking the church to be flavor, to, to be the spice of life. That salt also, they didn't have refrigerators or freezers. Their primary way of um, saving things, preserving things. Salt, yeah. Have you ever had salt fish from a can? Yeah. <laughs> or a salted ham? Yeah. Oh, there's this place up in Alabama that sells salted pork chops. Whoa. So good. So good. They don't, they're not kept in a refrigerator. They just permeate salt. And it's um, so terrific and bad for you. <laughs> so another way of saying being the salt of the world, it's, um, it's being the valuable thing, because salt is currency. Number two, it's be the interesting thing, because to be a Christian is to stand out from the rest of the world, because the rest of the world doesn't see with beatitude eyes. How about being a disruptor? A disruptor? To be a, to be a Christian and to follow the beatitudes is to turn the powers uh, on, its, on its head and to open up a new way of life. And then the third thing here was um, preserve. So to be the salt is to preserve. Um, God wants to save the whole world. The whole world. God's not even here just to save people. He, his mission is to save the cosmos. That is including everything, right? The cosmos is not even just this world, but it's like... Jesus died to save Mars. I mean, that, that's what the Bible teaches. That Jesus died to save the whole cosmos. This is, we're thinking big here. And, uh, and we're the salt to help preserve, to help preserve and keep, keep the world whole and healthy. Okay? Uh, light. Yeah. All right. Okay, you're going to go farther back. I wanted you to get to you because he's speaking oh. to the Jews, but yet he just spoke to those The y'all, um, I've had that in parentheses because the you here is plural, and I just love that in the South here we've got some linguistical helps because you can't really tell whether the you is singular and plural in our Bible, and so I really would like them to do a new Bible translation that includes the y'alls because this is, hey, y'all are the salt of the earth, uh, y'all are the light of the world, and um, and. I, 
I tend to think that, um, that he is talking directly about, to, to the crowds, which are, um, are uh, people who are interested in, there are some references to disciples as we get a little further. So there are people who are burgeoning disciples. In fact, we even have, and he says to the disciples here in a little bit, in the Matthew's Gospel, how many disciples have we called? Only four. So we're not, we're not yet talking about the twelve. Well, why are there twelve disciples, huh? Because we're recapitulating, right? I mean, surely there was 13 and 14, but we're not thinking here in terms of how many disciples there are. We're thinking in terms of theology. We're painting a picture of Israel. You see what I see? How we're see? This is not. Um, this is sometimes we read scripture so literally that we don't see what it literally says, right? <laughs> That, like, we don't see what it says. What Matthew wants us to know is that Jesus has, has recapitulated the people of God in himself. In himself. And so I think that, I think that the y'all here is a pretty inclusive group where he wants the, the church, we're going to move on to that word in a few lessons, ecclesia. He wants the church to be the light of the world. And so um, I don't think that he's expecting... Um, Sometimes we expect our government to do that. Uh, Winthrop, um, the, one of the first governors of the Pilgrim Colony, talked about America being a city on a hill. So we have a tradition with lots of presidents referring to America as a city on a hill. And um, maybe that's good, but God didn't call um, uh, our government to do that. God has called the church to be this. And uh, I think that uh, maybe it's not helpful to mix them all up sometimes. Um, God has called us. We can't, we can't expect... A, we can't expect the government to do it. We have to do it. It's, that, it's our job. Just a follow up then. So he's speaking to the crowd, and there may be Gentiles and Jews out there, but he's speaking to the crowd. So he's saying, You're the salt of the earth. You know, here's the only hope for the earth, but this is the model you have to follow. Yeah. And in doing so, so the, the people of Israel were made a people at Sinai. That's where they were birthed. Here in North side of the Galilee Lake, um, last chapter, last week, we called it Galilee of the Gentiles. That was a reference to the prophecy. Um, but, but this land is covered with Gentiles. I mean, there are Gentiles on the other side of the lake. There's Gentiles all around. And so this crowd is a crowd filled with all kinds of different people. But Jesus is creating a new community, is creating, is constituting community with his teaching, Torah, as the Lord did at Sinai with Israel. So the same, the same kind of thing is happening. Let's move on a little bit more to the bad stuff, huh? These are called the antitheses. And it is, um, you heard it said, blank, but now I say to you, blank. Right? We kind of, do you know some of these? Uh, before we get there, I think this is really important to go to verse 17. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, when, let until heaven, when iota will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so sometimes Christians will say, well, you know, in the Old Testament, um, well, God was kind of mean, and there were all these laws, and then Jesus came, and we got the gospel, and God was more like all sweet and stuff. Right? We say that a lot. Have you ever heard any story kind of like that? That ain't right. That ain't right. God has been God from the very beginning. And the same God in the Old Testament is the same God in the New Testament. It's the same story. And um, Martin Luther kind of, Martin Luther helped us out a lot. But that's one way he hurt us. Martin Luther taught that there was a big difference between law and gospel. And there isn't. There isn't. The gospel is the same thing as the law. Any good Jew can tell you that too. Um, but the gospel is the law at its core. It's uh, beyond. It's deeper. It's in the law, but it's deeper than the law. The law was to help save the world, teaching us about grace and mercy. 
but the, the gospel is the kernel at the, at the core of the law. And so um, when Jesus talks about, I didn't come to abolish it, I've come to fulfill it, he's, he's come to radicalize it. Radicalize. What does the word radicalize mean? To shake it up. Okay. Intensify. Intensify. Yeah, the word radical comes from the same word as radish, and it comes from the word root in Latin. So it's to take it to its root, the core of what it is. And so Jesus is taking the Ten Commandments, the Torah, and taking it all to its root. So it's not really the law. The, the words of the law that are important, it is the meaning and the root behind it, the, the principle that the law teaches. And so that's, that's what Jesus has come to do. Unless your righteousness succeeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. Now, what was, what was a better word for righteousness we learned earlier? Justice, right? We, we, um, in, the, in our American world, we like to talk about our righteousness, like it's... Um, Oh, that we're being good and stuff. That's not quite what Jesus is talking about here. The same word is justice. Unless the kind of justice that you offer exceeds the justice of the Torah, then, it's, and it, it says here, greater, greater righteousness is another way of saying it. Greater righteousness is greater justice. So what is greater justice? It's like a mer mercy, right? So whenever somebody slaps you on one cheek, you turn the other cheek, you've just offered not just justice, justice would have allowed you to slap right back, right? An eye for an eye. But greater justice is going all the way to grace and mercy. So it's, it's inside the boundaries of justice, but this is greater righteousness. And so all of Jesus' teachings from this point on are all about greater. You've heard it say, don't murder, that's a pretty good principle. I don't think you should do it, right? Um, and, um, but Jesus takes it further. What does he say? Yeah, if you are angry. Has anybody in here been angry? Oh, man. Oh, man. Once or twice today. I mean, this, I mean. <clears throat> yeah, so angry, then you've done it. So Jesus has taken the core principle of murder and brought it all the way down, down to our hearts. And so I summarize this here as love shows no hostility. These are all about how to be loving. Um, justice is, um, is one thing. Justice is when you do, when you give somebody what they're due. But Jesus wants us to go further into love. And in love, you don't just give somebody what you deserve. If my wife loved me like I deserve to be loved, I would be in a heap of trouble, right? But love goes beyond what you deserve. It's just pure gift. It's, it's self-giving. That's what, that's what love is about. And so Jesus wants us to go beyond <laughs> what you have to do because it's right. That's standard righteousness to a greater righteousness, which is love. So now this starts to sound like 1 Corinthians 13, doesn't it? Love shows no hostility. Let's move on to adultery. Yeah, this is a fun one. Um, you shall not commit adultery, but I say, if you look with the woman with lust, you've already committed adultery with her in his heart. Woo! This is, huh? Give me heart. Give me heart. <laughs> okay. Um, yet if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. Um, yep, it goes on and on and on there. Yes, yeah, so, um, so in this... Um, well, we'll cover these. We'll cover these two together. Um, this is uh, love is not uh, predatory. So uh, the 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 point is on the person that is um, powering over the um, in this case a, a wife or a woman. And um, so this is similar to, to rape. Love love doesn't doesn't um, um, treat people like objects. Um, where we have power over objectifying, objectifying people and having power over them. Uh, that's, that's, not what, that's not what love does. Jesus uh, brings it down. It's, this is not really about a passing fantasy. Um, this, is about, um, this is about power over people. And, um, and that, that's the core of the sin of, of lust. 
And so Jesus takes what was a pretty, um, you know, committing adultery, um, a pretty easy thing to see, into something that's in the human heart, and into everybody's heart. About divorce, uh, kind of same thing. You've, um, it's also said, he who divorces his wife gives her the certificate of divorce. So in the, in the Old Testament, is divorce okay? Yep. 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 <laughs> if you're a man, right? <laughs> if you're a man, it's fine. Um, yep. And the Jewish it's... people still do it that way. Hmm. They have well, to go before a minion and get well, and, 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 um, and the man has to go before In the Catholic the Church, you get an, an annulment. So Jesus is teaching is really hard about, a cho about divorce, but listen to this, 32. But I say that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So in this sense, whose sin is it? The, the husband, right? And so, what in the, in the Old Testament, it's almost always on the woman. And this, Jesus is saying, well, the man is responsible too, and he's even responsible in causing her to commit adultery. And so, Jesus has just upended the patriarchal power structure that we know from the Old Testament, where now the woman has a right. And of course, what is he really worried about? Is um, there's a there's a reason primarily why. Divorce is not allowed in civilizations like the Hebrew civilization is that it prevented safety for families, right? Because women had to be inside a family structure to be safe. They couldn't just go off and make their own living and raise their kids by themselves. They didn't have independence. And so to be, to be divorced is to be cut off in poverty, to have no security. And so Jesus is concerned about the welfare of the blessed ones that we just read about. This is, this is a social concern about leaving somebody without any rights, without leaving somebody out there in the cold. I think that is a driving concern. And so I said, well, my translation is, love should be in marriage. Pretty good, huh? Love should be in marriage. How about the oath business? You heard it said in ancient times, this one's kind of hard, that you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, don't swear at all. What are we talking about here? Let your yeas be yea and your nays be nay. Yes, yeah, so what is Jesus telling us to do? Be people of our word. Be people of our word. So in the Old Testament, there were two different kinds of speaking. You could speak under oath, or you could speak normally. The difference about being under oath is you say, I swear that I, well, like putting your hand on the Bible and making a promise, that's an oath. Right? So in the Old Testament, they have this thing where you could say, I swear to God that I'm going to do this. And then you have to tell the truth. But then if, if you didn't swear to God, well, then you could possibly lie. Right? Or um, we still follow this in our American government system where you can, um, you can speak, testify under oath. And, you know, it's against the law to lie while under oath. We call that perjury. Right? But it's not against the law to lie. You can go out there and lie all you want today, and it's not against the law. It's only against the law to lie under oath. And so what is Jesus saying? No, there is not a difference between being under oath and not under oath. Uh, in, there, there's only one thing, and that is speaking the truth. See? Where he's gotten down to the core of the truth, that there is, there is no special case. Yes, because God is there in our hearts, or and is is listening all the time. That's that's wonderful reflection. Yeah. So um, uh, then we got retaliation. We're not going to get to prayer tonight. We're not going to go for two hours. I promise. <laughs> um, we'll, I wanted to do the Lord's prayer separately. It might take us a year to do Matthew, but I'm like, <laughs> but the, the gospels are fun, huh? Are y'all doing okay so far? We're getting into this a little bit, learning some new things. Let's get to retaliation. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Okay, now that's called the law of retaliation. 
uh, it was first written on uh, Hammurabi's code, and um, and that's a, that is a um, a um, we talked about this when we got to Exodus a couple of months ago that that was a limiting function. You know, normally somebody says, well, you know, that guy poked out my eye. Our family's gonna get together and we'll poke out both of his, right? Or he killed my son. I'm gonna kill all of his children. And so that, that's normal. The Old Testament says no. It has to be proportional. So it's a limiting function. So that's already good. It's already good or helpful. But Jesus says, well, the principle there is you, you have a limiting function because the other person is valued by God as well. And, and the purpose and the function there, the limiting function, is a grace and merciful function. And so Jesus says we need to go even further than that. So it's not different than that. It's further in the same direction. Does that, does that kind of make sense how these antitheses work? They're not really. They ain't, the church in the Middle Ages called them antitheses like they were opposites. Murder and anger are not opposites. They are in the same direction. Adultery and lust are in the same direction. The law of retaliation, proportional. It's, it's the same thing we're supposed to practice just war. You don't disproportionately attack your enemy. You, you have to do it on the same footing to be ethical. So this is, this is the same kind of, it's in the same direction as Lex Talianus, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I say to you, what? If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give them your cloak as well. Now this is kind of funny because um, your cloak is your, your shirt, your undershirt. If anybody wants to, then your cloak is your toga. Right, your outer robe. And so, once you've given them your undershirt and your outer robe, well, what are you left with? You're naked as the day you're born. So this, it's a little bit funny. There's a little bit of a, of a joke here. But, but he's also turning the shame on the predator. Because by, by robbing you, he is, he is making you naked before before everyone else, and therefore shame falls upon him because he's taken it too far. Yeah, and you've stepped into a scholarly argument here. Um, on, um, is Jesus telling us this because this is the way to succeed in the world? And I think that um, the, the non-violent way of Gandhi and Martin Luther King kind of show us that there is a way of success here. And so I think that there's a piece of that that's right. Um, but I think that the overarching point is, um, is that even if it's not successful, um, God will take care of it in the end. That sometimes it is successful, um, but, we don't, but it, we don't do it as a strategy to win. We do it because it's graceful and right, and that God will win whether we get to win with God or not. And, uh, and so I think uh, I like to answer it sort of with a both and. Because I think that there is some, um, there's some scholarly work done about um, Matthew adds the um, the right cheek here that um, that means that it was with the left with the left hand and that there's um, there's the the, the hitter has to um, humiliate you and uh, and bringing bringing shame onto the whole scenario. So I think there there might be some um, some little hints like that. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. And then, well, this is we'll have to He's stop here. To Jews, right? Yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah. And don't refuse anyone. Well, that's um, that's important. Um, just to, to to step ahead, because this is one of those seminal uh, scriptures. There were probably Romans in the audience. And they were going back to report to their superiors. Jesus was just the kind of rabbi that, the, that Rome would like because they wanted their, their subjected countries to be passive. Jesus, as the Romans are interpreting it, are, is saying, if someone strikes you on the, on the left cheek, turn your right cheek also. Be subjective. And, and the Romans are going to take this to heart. They don't want Jesus to die in the end. I just throw that out. It's not part of the, the context here, but it, it's the Yeah, well, and then that's where there is some argument. Is um, is Jesus encouraging them to be salty here and um, and to basically, well, I think what he's really saying is when the Romans show you hate, 
you show them love. Because what we want to do is respond with hate. That's, that's the normal thing to do. Um, it turns out that if you show Rome love, they freak out. You know, so it's equally as scary. Maybe love is even scarier than hate. I think that they didn't realize that crucifying that man on the top of that hill was going to upset their empire. You know, they, 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 they didn't realize how dangerous that the most, the most powerful weapon in our arsenal is not those nuclear warheads. It's love. It doesn't now... The Defense Department won't tell you this <laughs> because they don't believe it, right? Our government doesn't believe this. Americans don't believe this, but Christians do. We believe that the most powerful weapon we have is love. Now, does that make any sense? No, not really. But it's what we believe. It's what we believe. Yeah. It makes sense because the kingdom of God is coming, and that's something that we that we believe in. Yeah. Yes. Whatever of the, the load of the soldier. And when he said, okay, your time's up, and I said, hey, that's okay, I'll take another month. Don't you think that that would address him? And they said, ooh, this is some different kind of person here. There's something different coming on. I think that's right. And I mean, when, when Jesus is being crucified, he's praying, forgive them. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I mean, that, a Roman soldier standing nearby said, Surely, this must have been the Son of God. And so, so love is more powerful. It was John Wayne. It really was. It was John Wayne. Um, and so the last thing, because we got to talk to it, talk about it, is he says, Be perfect. Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And what we're talking about here is not Greek perfection. Greeks like Euclidean geometry, which is like this philosophical perfection. That's not Jewish perfection. This perfection is defined by how perfection is used in the Old Testament. Matthew had before him the Septuagint written in Greek. And so we can trace back that same word. And we find that it's synonymous with wholeness and shalom and this kind of, this kind of um, organic um, healing and wholeness. And so what Jesus is asking for is us to live into that, into that kind of thing. And that's closer to what John Wesley talked about, about um, being perfect in love. Being perfect is not, not making a mistake. It's not, um, it's not not being sick. Um, being perfect is about having our, to, to work on our intentions, to get down to the root, to radicalize our own hearts and lives and figure out what's in there. And that's really the core of the Sermon on the Mount uh, today. We're going to get to a lot more next week about prayer and the Lord's Prayer. We might spend a long time on that as well. Um, so in summary, to kind of get back to it, is about what's in our heart. Following the law is not about following, um, following because it's the right thing to do. We don't not murder because there's a sign at the edge of town that says, here's a rule, don't murder. Right? So that, that's, Jesus is saying, eternally does you no good, you need to have love in your heart. If you have love in your heart, what's the greatest commandment? It says it in Matthew later on. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. So now you can see how it's filling up all of these Commandments. We're going to have to come back to it because um, i got to let people go to choir and such. Um, but hold it for next week because we're going to have plenty of time to review. I hope you've enjoyed a little bit of our uh, journey through these um, heavy duty. This is the important sermon. This is our founding, our founding document. So for concluding, we'll, um, we'll sing a little prayer. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. In my heart, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. In my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Go in peace and serve the Lord.